Hey everyone, and welcome to Divi Nation episode 15. This is the last episode of our first season. After this show, we'll be taking a short break for the holidays and coming back with season two in the new year. That said, we will still be publishing some Divination shorts over the holiday break. So for all of you who've come to enjoy listening or watching Divination on a weekly basis, we'll still be around just in a shorter form. If, on the other hand, you're tuning in for the first time to this episode, you'd probably like to know what this show is all about. Divination is a podcast and YouTube show by Elegant Themes, a leader in the premium WordPress theme and plugin market. The goal of Divination is really simple. We want to provide you with the knowledge, insights, and supportive community you need to be successful with WordPress and Divi. I'm your host, Nathan B. Weller, and as your host, it's my job to facilitate all that by having various guests from the Divi and wider WordPress community onto the show to share their stories and experience with you. To that end, the topic of today's show is building and launching productized services. This is a business model that many in the WordPress community have found success with, and we'd like to shed some light on what exactly it is and how to succeed with it. To help me explore this topic, I was joined by Divi community member Tim Striffler. Tim is a freelance web designer with entrepreneurial aspirations. And while he spends most of his days working on client websites, he's determined to build a productized service on top of WordPress that generates passive income. His first attempt at this was a site called premiumwebsite.com, which is a wedding website builder that he created using WordPress and Elegant Themes. His next business is going to be geared more towards B2B instead of B2C and incorporate everything he learned from his first endeavor into his second. When we caught up recently on Skype, we talked about all of that and a lot more. Here's our conversation. Tim, welcome to Divi Nation. Thanks, Nathan, for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problems. How are you doing today, man? Doing well. It's uh, Tuesday, so no complaints so far. So yeah, happy to be on the show today. Cool. So, wh what's your typical work day look like? I'm always interested to know. Yeah, so um, I, like many freelancers, have the, the pleasure and convenience of having a home office and, and working from mm -hmm. home. So yeah, I typically try to start the day early. Um, I'm more productive in the mornings answering emails first thing and then usually just diving into to whatever project that I, I, I'm working on at that period of time. So the the cool thing about being a freelancer is every day is a little bit different. Every project yeah. is a little bit different, which is is good for me because I, I can get bored with rep <laughs> repetition. So um, mixing it up is, is always is always a good thing. See, I thrive on um, on like a routine. I'm a big routine person. So even though every day the work does change up, which is really right. nice, um, I'm the kind of person who's like, I like to wake up early. I like to get into like, I have a set number of things I do each day or yeah. a set time that I do things. And if that gets out of whack, I'm all over the place. If I, if I can keep that though, I'm good. I'm solid. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think having a, a balance of the two, having yeah. some parts of your day routine and then it's some of the work kind of different that, every That was day. actually something Sarah and I talked about in the last episode yeah. was like the idea of this. Uh, structuring your day so that you're consistently productive, but you also allow room for like new stuff to come in and out and like vary things. Yeah. So we called it like serendipity. It was one of the articles. I right. Think. Yeah. No, that was a great episode. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure Sarah <laughs> appreciates that as well. Uh, oh, absolutely. Speaking of articles, do you want to get into our first segment and talk about some, uh, some WordPress articles? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Okay, so this week in WordPress, three articles caught my eye. I sent them ahead of time to Tim so that he could read them and we could talk about them. Article number one, five ways to add recurring revenue to your WordPress business. This was published on Elegant Themes blog, our blog, and it was written by Joe Filan. Some of the advantages to adding recurring revenue um, that he listed were it helps you to build a more stable business, build longer term relationships, spend more time with each client. Um, and then he gave five ways to add recurring revenue. Uh, WordPress maintenance and support, uh, offering advertising or PPC support or strategy, search marketing um, or SEO as most people think of it, uh, conversion optimization, and content and social media management. So Tim, what did you think of this article? I think it was a, a great article. I'm very big on recurring revenue, which is what we'll probably end yeah. up talking about a lot today. <laughs> um, I think most freelancers can relate to the phrase feast or famine, where oh, absolutely. your cash flow is going up and down, it's inconsistent, and um, 
you know, some days or, or some months are busy months, some you're, you're, you're straggling to try to find work. Mm-hmm. So I think finding ways to have recurring revenue can be really important um, for the cash flow. So I, I think every freelancer is a little bit different. Everyone brings a, a different set of skills to the table, a um, little bit different experience. And obviously every market's different too. So f- trying to figure out what are the best ways to provide value to a client on an ongoing basis to, to generate that recurring revenue. Um, I'm not particular huge on, on for me, at least selling SEO services. I think it can get a little bit messy. There's mm-hmm. a lot of education that has to take place with the client, <laughs> making sure that they don't think that if they- Tim, why aren't we for, number one on, on yeah. Google right now? <laughs> exactly. So I, I typically don't do- um, SEO services, unless a client that I'm already building a website for really insists on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there's there's definitely a lot of opportunities with maintenance, um, providing uh, backups as part of a, an ongoing package as well. Um, I think that could be part of a recurring revenue model. But yeah, I think as, as a freelancer, finding ways to, to do that is, is really important. Yeah, so this is actually something we spent a significant time talking about on the Marie Poulin episode. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea of transitioning into digital strategy and including your design and, and development work within a more, um, I guess, robust or long-term um, business strategy or digital strategy approach so that you can have this kind of recurring revenue like, hey, let's create a huge plan that includes a lot of stuff. And then every week, month, whatever, I'll chip away at it and we'll just keep, you'll just keep me on payroll or, you know, on contract or whatever. Right, right. Definitely. Which I think is a really cool approach. All right, let's jump to the second article, article number two. Don't call yourself a developer if you don't code. This article was <laughs> published on devwp.eu and it was written by Mario Peshev. Uh, So the main thrust of this article, as the title would suggest, is that there is a big difference between being a developer in the traditional sense, someone who writes code, and what the term has kind of come to mean within the WordPress community, uh, someone who builds websites with WordPress. And a lot of times that term is used regardless of whether or not that person actually knows and can write code. Uh, So he shares the Wikipedia definition of a developer. I'm sure there's other definitions out there that might have a bit more authority, but It'll work. Software development is the process of computer programming, documenting, testing, and bug fixing involved in creating and maintaining applications and frameworks involved in a software relief release lifecycle and resulting in a software product. The term refers to a process of writing and maintaining the source code, but in a broader sense of the term, it includes all that is involved between the concept between the conception of the desired software through to the final manifestation of the software, ideally in a planned and structured process. So this definition actually contrasts pretty starkly with how the term is often used in and around the WordPress community, where maybe the words or the terms WordPress designer or WordPress admin or WordPress uh, maintenance might be a better fit. Uh, Some of the negative results as outlined by Mario in this post, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, are as follows. A massive misunderstanding for both clients and service providers in the WordPress community about what development actually entails. A pricing race to the bottom for WordPress development that doesn't really take into account the real costs of development. Poor site performance and security. Amateur code and plugins and themes or just sloppy code. Uh, And then he he thinks one of the big problems is a disenchantment of large enterprise level customers or potential large enterprise level customers who get burned working with people who bill themselves as something that they're not and kind of ruin it for everybody else. So I was wondering, Tim, uh, what are your thoughts on this and where do you fall in in the terminology that he puts forward? Yeah, absolutely. This was a a great article. Um, It is definitely a very relevant topic in the, the community today. I, I found it a little interesting that he gave the definition for, for software development when he's talking about <laughs> the website development, because in my opinion, those can be very different things, um, very different people that, that work on software than work on web. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually went ahead and looked up the de- definition for web developer. And uh, let's see, it's and this is according to dictionary.com. Okay, um, cool. So it's a person or company that develops worldwide web software applications or that creates and maintains websites. And I think that's interesting. It seems like they've sort of um, evolved the definition to more of what a lot of people that call themselves developers actually do, which is creating and maintaining a website opposed to actually coding it. 
Um, I thought the emphasis on source code was probably where he was going with the software thing because, you know, we still have like the source code of our plugins, the source code of our themes, the source code of WordPress itself. And I think what he's getting at is like if you're not able to write those things or work on those things, you don't have to be the person they chose to, you know, lead up a section of WordPress. I don't think he's trying to suggest that. Right. But I think he's just saying you need to be in that range. You need to be able to do that. Um, Yeah. To be considered like an actual WordPress developer. That's yeah. his that's his position. I actually tend to agree with that. I wrote an article not too long ago um, on Elegant Themes um, as part of the – it's called General Pricing Guide for WordPress. We've actually talked about it a few times on the podcast. And part of what I say in there is that there's this sort of animosity that I think exists between what I call power users. He called them WordPress super admins or whatever. Right. But mm-hmm. I think there's a big difference between like a WordPress power user, someone who is really good with the tools that developers have created and can yeah. help non-WordPress users or people who are maybe novices with WordPress get up to speed or set up their website or set up and maintain their website. So these people are becoming more and more of a commodity within the WordPress community, but they're not developers. And I, and I right. encourage people to make that distinction because, you know, like he says, there can be some really negative side effects of having a, an inaccurately perceived or bloated community in which most of the people aren't actually what they're billing themselves as. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I can definitely understand that. Um, for me, I, I'm kind of in between cause I'm, I'm more than a, a, a power user or super admin, mm. but I'm not going to be writing a PHP plugin from scratch. So HTML, CSS, I'm, I'm very well versed in, um, editing PHP and, and kind of tweaking it and, and moving around code I can do. But again, I'm not a, a full blown, uh, programmer. Um, sure. I, I try to stay away from calling myself a developer for that reason. Right. Um, Usually, like the the verbiage on on my personal website is um, more about creating websites because I, I do the, both the design and the development. I won't call myself a designer or developer, mm-hmm. more of a website creator. Um, there you go. And I I think that um, definitely there is a problem with the 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 naming of of the position. Um, but I I think it's it's hard when the Technology is moving so quickly, and there's all these tools like like Divi, for example, um, has almost created a, a profession for freelancers that can specialize yeah. in Divi. And I mean, that's kind of what this this whole podcast is about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But again, I consider the bulk of those users, you know, unless like you know, unless they're actually creating, um, you know, plugins. plug yeah, plugins to go along with it, or or they're able to code, you know plugins and child themes, stuff like that, you know, they're, they're probably more in the power user category than, than in the developer right. category. And sometimes those things blur a little bit, but I, personally, I would always say err on the side of like, I don't know, err on the side of caution. Like if you're not thoroughly versed in something, then don't, don't quite, don't claim that title. If oh, you, totally. if you're, if you dabble in it, then just, you know, then that can almost be like, you're okay. I'm a, I'm a WordPress power user, but I also know a bit of PHP or I also know a bit of this or, you know, I'm, I'm good with CSS. That's that that then becomes a bonus as opposed to somebody going, oh, well, you're not really what you said you are, are you? Right. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I, I see it being more of a problem for employers that are, are trying to hire the right person, yeah. the right developer. And I think that's what he where he was coming from in the article. He was interviewing people and he was right. like, oh, my gosh, what is going on? These people are not actually developers. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel clients typically, from my experience at least, don't really care. They want mm-hmm. someone that can deliver them a, a website, a, a solution. Yeah. Um, whether or not you're... Regardless of how you get to that solution, they yeah. just want the end product. Exactly. And that's why so many people are able to use Divi and other WordPress products to create solutions for small businesses and, mm-hmm. and so forth. So, But yeah, yeah, definitely an interesting article altogether. Yeah, let's jump to the third and final article. It's called... I want a clean layout and other things WordPress developers are sick of hearing. So this article was published at WPMUDev.org, and it was written by Brenda Barron. So as you can probably tell by the title, it's a collection of phrases WordPress developers are tired of hearing from their clients. And I'm guessing if we're going to use the definition or standards that we just talked about in the previous (laughs) article, we should probably expand that to designers, super admins, power users, whatever. Um, She listed 21 phrases. I don't think we have time to get into all of them, but I did 
um, set aside or note some of my favorites. Uh, the first one for me was we need to rank high on search engines. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I guess before we get into why these are kind of funny or these are exasperating, we should probably say this is not like to bash clients. It's just to say like, and actually that was one of the things was, you know, the client is stupid was one of the other phrases that they're tired of hearing other developers say. And I don't think we ever want to get into the, you know, oh, clients are all dumb. They're, they're not dumb. They have, you know, they may not have the same level of expertise as you, um, but I think a lot of where these phrases come from are just the, the sort of gray areas where clients and the people who they hire are not necessarily on the same page. They're not, you know, one party's not doing a good job of communicating and it, th there tend to be patterns in how that happens over and over and over again. And I think the idea of this article was to say, hey, you know, we can relate to having clients say these types of things. Now, if you're a client, here's why that comes across wrong to <laughs> the person that you're talking to. Um, so another one of mine was, why do I have to pay more for that? And I think <laughs> that's always funny because, you know, A, it's a service and people get caught up on, you know, wanting to, wanting what they want for as little as possible. And they don't really think of add-ons as add-ons a lot of times. So they're like, oh yeah, I want this, I want that. And when it comes to, asking for more, they just consider like, well, I already paid you, you know, X amount that should include any and everything that has to do with my website, even though it's going to take you three extra weeks to do or something, <laughs> something along those lines. Exactly. Uh, did any of the, the phrases stand out to you as things that you've heard or had to deal with or, you know, had to educate a client on? Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like I could relate to pretty much all of them at least a little <laughs> bit, but I, I marked down a couple um, the first one, this should be quick and easy. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I think every uh, designer, developer, freelancer can relate to that. Yes. From a client's perspective, oh, you're just adding this one little feature on, mm -hmm. but they don't realize what goes into that. Um, I had a, a client recently that said, oh, I sent over the changes. This should be really quick and easy. Let's get the site launched as soon as possible. And after looking through them, really what he wanted w was for me to essentially redesign the whole homepage. And so <laughs> it wasn't exactly a, a quick and easy thing. And, um, we, we, I talked to him and we, um, essentially came to a compromise and, and yeah. so forth. So um, what, do, what do you do? Like, what is, you said you talked to him and you guys came to a compromise. I mean, how do you handle when someone, I guess, I don't want to overstate this, but they drastically or grossly misunderstand, um, what it is you do or what is required of you to do what they're asking. How do you approach that with a client? Cause that's the actual taking like a something practical away from this conversation, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at first I was extremely irritated and I wanted to, <laughs> to call him and basically tell him like, there's no way that's going to happen. Um, I, I took a, a day to kind of, um, think it through and, and figure out the, mm -hmm. the best solution. And it kind of goes to, um, one of the, the phrases, the client is stupid. I, I had to realize he's not stupid. He's really smart. He's great at what he does in, in his field. Mm -hmm. And so it's just going to take a little bit of education on my part yeah. to show him, hey, what you actually brought up isn't necessarily quick and easy. It's a lot of little things. Um, some of them are actually bigger things that are going to take a lot more time. So you know, I want to make sure you're happy with the site and that this is something that you, you love and that you're, you're proud to show off. So we can do those things, but keep in mind, it's going to push the launch date back a couple of weeks probably. So maybe let's figure out what are some of the most um, high priority items that yeah. you, you want to absolutely have done right away. And then we can tackle the rest at a later time. And then after he heard that, he realized, oh, I didn't even realize that. Mm -hmm. You're right. Those things really aren't even necessary. I, I feel like when he was looking at it, he was almost like trying to come up with things um, for changes just to feel like he was doing his job. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. And then you wanted to have more input, something like that. Yeah, exactly. And then once we talked it through, he didn't even care about those other things. It, it turned out to be just a couple things that actually were minor. And yeah. so we're able and to, I, I think that most stage. clients are not, they're not actually, um, inconsiderate. They're not actually, right. you know, obstinate or whatever. They're not actually trying to be a problem. Um, mm -hmm. and if you can talk to them calmly and, and explain things and be, re and be reasonable yourself, most of them will come around like, like in your case, and they'll, they'll see what you're talking about. They'll understand what you're talking about. Cause again, they're not stupid. 
And yeah, exactly. Not 99% of the time. You got <laughs> There's always going to be somebody. But, always exceptions. <laughs> yeah. Um, another one that I liked was ASAP. Everything mm-hmm. has to be as soon as possible. Everything's yep. like, hey, can you get this to me right away? I know that we haven't been working together. Or whatever. <laughs> like, I, I've had clients, they'll email me. Um, I, I'll ask them for some content. And two weeks will go by. I haven't heard anything from them. I'll have sent them an email. Hey, just checking up on that. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then all of a sudden when they do get in touch, it's like, here's some stuff. I need it done right now, right today. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. we got to plan these things out. We got a schedule to stay or I have a schedule to stay to. I can't just jump off of other people's work to do yours today when, you know, I asked for it two weeks ago. Right. Exactly. And then when, when everything's like that too, it's kind of like the old phrase, if everything's a fire drill, then nothing is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if, no, if you totally. want everything now, then it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. And I think, again, those are, those are, expectation setting conversations that that Mm -hmm. end up being really helpful, particularly if you're trying to build those like long term relationships. Yeah, absolutely. All Um, right. One more for me, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Yeah, go for it. The uh, I think it was towards the bottom. I I know you were the expert and advised differently, (laughs) but um, I can relate to this one. Um, And and the the quote I think of is a, a Steve Jobs quote. Uh, which he said at one point, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. Mm-hmm. We hire smart people so that they can tell us what to do. Yeah, uh, And I think that's such a great quote for uh, designers and, and freelancers and, and so forth because that happens so much where a client oh, yeah. hires us to do something and then they, they put our, our skills in a box and say, mm-hmm. okay, we want a great website, but we need you to keep our color scheme and our logo and everything, which doesn't look good. And you try to design around that and you try to educate them and it's, yeah, it's a lost cause. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, a lot of these phrases and a lot of, um, just situations that we're talking about, almost all of them can be either avoided or worked through with conversations like filtering conversations or, um, expectation setting conversations before you even start working with somebody. So mm-hmm. like uh, Leslie Bernal's episode, uh, an episode or two back, we talked about how to filter out problem clients. So mm, like yeah. to me, a problem client is someone who says something like these phrases and then after you have a reasonable, intelligent conversation with them about you know educating them on, on, on your side of, of the equation, and they are like, no, you know, that's a problem client. Yeah, you know, that's that's a client who is not willing to work with you and be reasonable. So, yeah. but one you thing that, flag. yeah, exactly. So one thing that we talked about was how do you filter those people out before that they even become a client? And I think you know a big part of that is just recognizing, okay, these are certain red. Each of these statements is a type of red flag, and you might call them like you know not quite red flags if you're <laughs> able to work around them with a good conversation. But uh, any, definitely anyone who, after that initial conversation, is not willing to back down from one of these statements is going to be probably considered a problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, cool. So I think that does it for This Week in WordPress. If you're interested in reading the articles that we discussed, YouTube viewers, you can check out the video description for links, and everyone else can find the show notes on our blog. Just go to the community category in the right-hand sidebar and check out the post for Divi Nation episode 15. So the next segment of the show is where we get to know our guest hosts in a bit more detail and pick their brain on this episode's main topic. Our guest today is Tim Striffler, and our topic is building and launching productized services. Let's get into it. So Tim, as always, I'd like to learn a bit more about you before we dive into the real meaty stuff of our topic. Um, Specifically, I'd like to know, you know, where you came from, where you come from, and how you got to where you are now. Could you tell us your story? Yeah, absolutely. So I graduated from college in 2011 with a uh, business entrepreneurship degree. And ever since that point, I've always wanted to work for myself, start my own business. Uh, And so I I had a couple of jobs, marketing jobs, sales jobs, working for an SEO company after college. And on the side, I I started dabbling with WordPress. I uh, initially uh, I started my own blog and mm. it was a disaster. I realized <laughs> that I, I didn't really like writing. And so having a blog really wasn't the best thing for me at that point. And then I, I kind of put WordPress aside for a couple of years until I was engaged. Uh, my then fiance, now wife, 
we're, we're starting the wedding planning process. And so I was tasked with creating a wedding website. And so I did what most people do. And I Googled wedding websites or mm-hmm. wedding website builder. I'm, I'm in the middle of that process right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can relate. And um, I, I really didn't like what was out there. And I, I thought, hey, I could probably do something better. Mm-hmm. I wasn't a, a designer yet by any means or um, had barely dabbled with with WordPress. But I uh went back to my Elegant Themes membership um, that I had bought previously when I started the first blog. And I started the process of customizing a a theme. I I can't Mm. remember what theme. It might have been Chameleon. I can't remember. And uh, yeah, just started the process of of building a wedding website um, using one of Elegant Themes. And I got a lot of compliments on it. A lot of people said it looked great. Like it was Mm. so informative. We really liked it. And so I, I, I thought that there was some potential there. And so um, I, I started the process of creating a wedding website builder based on WordPress using themes from Elegant Themes oh, nice. uh, and, and creating a productized service. And then simultaneously, I was doing some uh, freelance jobs on the side as well, just for uh, general small businesses. I, I did a website for a lawyer, uh, uh, a dental lab, and so forth. And then this was also while I was working full time. And so... I, I so launched. You weren't busy at all. No, not yeah. at all. <laughs> so I I launched with um, my my father as my business partner. He's been a graphic designer for the past uh, twenty five to thirty years. Can't remember. Um, so he he was really the the core designer. I was more of the. Um, I don't want to say developer just based on our <laughs> earlier conversation, but the one kind of but the one sure. kind of pulling together all the the solution. And so we launched uh, premiumwebsite.com, which was a, a do-it-yourself wedding website builder based oh, on cool. WordPress. Wow. So, um, and then fast and, forward a couple years. And you built that as a productized service. Yeah, exactly. So it was meant to be an automated um, do-it-yourself solution. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea of creating something and then being able to continuously make money off of it for in right. Months, weeks so, and months, so the original years. idea was for not to really be a service so much as an actual product. So people would sign up, create their own and then be done. You guys would have just built the system that allowed people to do that. Yeah, exactly. So I, I guess the, the best um, example would be Squarespace, but specifically for wedding websites and then gotcha. built, built on WordPress, of course. Gotcha. And uh, sorry, you were going to say something else as I was Ask those um, questions. Yeah, so uh, at, we had launched. I was still working full time um, in, in a sales job, um, and then things didn't really work out. And we'll, we'll get to that later with with Premium Website. It, it, it didn't turn into a, a million dollar business like we had hoped, and so I was kind of at a crossroads. I, I hated doing sales full time, and so I was like, I'm gonna uh, take the leap and, and start doing WordPress uh, freelancing full time. And so mm-hmm. that was about four months ago. So it's still kind of fresh and in, in, yeah. in the full time swing of things. Um, and then now working on part two of, of, uh, the productized service. Um, right. So, so basically just to, I guess, set up the next segment, which is the, our main segment, our main conversation, building and launching productized services. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, you have done, and you still are doing freelance stuff for your, I guess your full time income at this, at this moment. And yep. you, you had one big go and it was a big go. I mean, I've your website, it's, is it website.com or premium website? Premium website.com. Yeah. So premium wed. And that's not website. It's wed with a D. So yeah, premium little, website. Little <laughs> yeah. Dot com. Uh, check it out. It's a cool, it's a cool site, cool service. It's still up and running, but you learned a lot of good lessons from that experience and, and you're looking to pick a new niche to try to create a productized service for, um, and, and you did something really nice, which was you provided me with, uh, I think eight lessons that you learned. And I'd love to just go through them one by one, talk about them, ask some questions. Is that cool yeah, with you? Absolutely. That sounds great. All right, cool. So, so these are eight lessons that Tim learned from launching one productized service on WordPress. And the, he's going to take what he's learned from these and put them into a second project. Um, Real quick, do, is there anything you can share about your second project? Or are you still keeping that under wraps for now? I uh, yeah, I wish I could say more. My my business partner, <laughs> my my father, is <laughs> really particular about sharing okay. certain details. No um, problem. 
I, I, I can say rather than going after the consumer market, which uh, premium website was uh, couples and um, engaged couples, mm-hmm. this is more of a business to business market. So cool. uh, we're able to have a little bit higher price points um, and so forth. But yeah, to, to be c- continued though, I definitely like sure. To yeah, and I'd love to if you, whenever you do launch, maybe we could have a, a follow up. So yeah, absolutely. He, here's the first of eight lessons. Number one, don't overdevelop or try to perfect the product. Create an MVP, that's a minimum viable product, and ship, our favorite word, ASAP. (laughs) (laughs) So so just to make sure everybody's on the same page, can you tell us what exactly a minimum viable product is? What makes it different from just an unfinished product? Yeah, definitely. So the the term MVP, minimal viable product, uh, is used when uh, a startup business has some sort of technology, some sort of product. And the, the point of it is to get the, the minimum product that is viable to sell and get it up and, and running as soon as possible mm-hmm. um, so that you can actually learn from your customers and, and get feedback and so forth. Without than, every conceivable bell and whistle attached to it or, or future feature that you'd like to have. Yeah, absolutely. And and that was a mistake that we made with premium website is I was trying to create the ultimate do it yourself builder um, with all the bells and whistles in the back end, looking at all the competitors I wanted to have everything that they had plus, you know, twice as much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I wanted to outdo them in features in every way, which it just took way too long. It took us Mm -hmm. two plus years to, to launch the service. And by that time, um, the market was extremely crowded. Uh, when I initially started it, which was back in towards the end of 2012, the only competitors out there were really outdated solutions. Um, mm. The designs weren't responsive. They, they looked like they were from 2005. And so that was where the huge opportunity was. Um, if you would have got out sooner, you could have got money from early customers and re- immediately reinvested that into speeding up your development process. Yeah, exactly. And so w- what ended up happening, though, was when, when we finally launched to a little over two years later, um, the market was very overcrowded. So not only had those outdated solutions been updated, but new there players was, had come in. Yeah, exactly. New new competitors came in that essentially had the same story as me that were um in the process of planning a wedding, saw that there wasn't anything good out there, and so decided <laughs> to create something themselves. Yeah, and so You're like not only that same product, they have the same story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it just w- was not good because we wanted to perfect the product. When if we would have just got an MVP, just the minimal mm-hmm. product that was viable to to do well and 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 sell and learn from, then we would have so, launched. So what is and, it that someone can do if 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 that's the case? If they're getting a, a, an MVP out. Um, What is something that people can do to make their minimum viable product more attractive than other minimum viable products? Or is the whole idea of an MVP just to be the first? Can can you help clear that up? Yeah. So um, I don't think an MVP has to be a a first, but I think if you're going to launch a product, um, typically you have something that isn't already out there. Um, So maybe there's a solution out there that you think you could do better Mm -hmm. Um, so your MVP more than likely should include whatever it is that would make better than the competition. (laughs) Otherwise, what's, what's the point of something? You're just going to be a copycat. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's probably the the best thing is, um, you know, what's your competitive advantage? Make sure it has that. But, um, besides that, don't try to, uh, perfect the product and and include every single feature and bell and whistle uh, possible. Awesome. So let's jump to, uh, lesson number two. Make no assumptions about your market. Do market research and learn the wants and needs of your customer. So that feels like there's a story behind it. What's what's going on with that one? Yeah, so we assumed that uh, a DIY or, or do-it-yourself wedding website builder was what the market wanted and needed. We looked at the competition, and, and that's what they had. They had do-it-yourself solutions. And so we figured if, if we could provide that but better, then mm. people will will obviously choose us. You know, they want to do it yourself solution. So if we provide a more powerful one that has more features, then we'd be the obvious choice. But that wasn't necessarily the case because when we finally launched and um, started getting some customers or, or people that were signing up for a free trial, we quickly realized that they weren't so stoked on c- customizing it themselves. So we mm-hmm. we had a very large number of 
signups that were signed up for the free trial. But after they they signed up and saw the back end and, and realized that this was going to be a little bit of a learning curve, um, they're going to have to invest a little bit of time and, and get their content together, get their photos. Then it was um, they realized it wasn't something that they wanted to do. And yeah. so we, we realized that, that um, if we were to provide more of a service where we created a wedding website for them, um, then it would be a lot more competitive because it wasn't something that they had to do. Um, as you know, right now, being engaged and planning a wedding, there's a lot going on. There's a on, lot, yeah. A lot of tasks <laughs> to complete. And so uh, by giving them something else to do, it yeah, it's not what they, they, they wanted to pay for. And so um, that was something that we would have learned if we would have done a little more market research, talked to more couples, figured out what they actually wanted mm -hmm. in a wedding website um, and what would be helpful to them and, and, and save time for them. So, so that's a good, that leads me to, to a question. I think it's actually two questions, but they're very closely related. One is what did, what would have um, increased market research looked like for you? And in general, how does someone go about conducting market research? I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, a report that someone with a big budget <laughs> buys from a huge data agency, right. you know, I got my market research in, but for someone who like us is just a freelancer or a solopreneur, what does that actually look like? What does market research look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think you're right. Market research has this like big meaning to it. And it's a little scary to, to think of doing market research. But I think it can be as simple as as talking to your potential customers. Um, so for me, that could have been reaching out to, to friends that were getting married and, and learning from them. Because I was doing this on the side, I, I felt like it had to be a secret. And I, I mm. didn't want my employer to know that I was starting a business on the side. <laughs> and so I, I, I wasn't really um, getting feedback from other people that were getting married and, and planning mm. weddings. Um, it could have been also reaching out to wedding planners or wedding photographers, people that are work in and around the industry or in and around your ideal customers. Yeah, exactly. And, and know the other products out there and the mm -hmm. services out there, know what um, our mutual customers want and need. And then it could have been also giving the product away for, you know, the first six months or so just to get a large amount of people using it and, and able to get feedback from them and uh, see what the pain points were mm. when, when trying like a, to, to use the product. Like a limited free beta of some kind? Yeah, exactly. We, we did a beta, but we didn't really promote it. And mm. um, it was essentially a handful of people that, that we knew that we let try it. So we could have done a lot more getting more people using it, talking to more people and, and getting as much feedback as possible. So I know you're not uh, giving a lot away for your second uh, go around at this, but what are some of the things that you're doing? Are, are you, how are you doing better market research this time around? I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah, great question. So we're, I'm kind of entering that stage right now. So I haven't done a, a whole lot yet. But it's essentially reaching out to our ideal target customers and asking them if they want to use, um, have a free site essentially, mm. um, and, and get the product completely free, no strings attached, lifetime customer for free. All they have to do is provide us with some feedback on, on it and, and what they want. So that's kind of the beginning stages of it. We're hoping to, to do some other things um, with uh, partners in the industry and, and getting some shared clients that way as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just kind of reaching out to people. Um, I, I have some connections in, in the, the niche as well. So that's, that's going to help with the market research too. Awesome. So let's jump to uh, lesson three. Lesson three is don't reinvent the wheel. So how did you guys uh, avoid reinventing the wheel for website? Yeah. So the, or did you, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. For the most part, I think this is something that we, we did pretty well. Um, because I'm not a full blown programmer, I, um, I don't have the, the skill set to create a content management system from scratch. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the competitors in, uh, this space that have wedding website builders, they had a proprietary website builder that they created oh, themselves okay. and it was solely used for this product. And so we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. WordPress is outstanding. It's the most popular content management system for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so we took the, the tools that we had with WordPress and the, the plugin community um, and then leveraging uh, developers that are well-versed in, in WordPress and, and created a, a couple of custom plugins as well. Um, and so 
when I say we didn't reinvent the wheel, we didn't try to create a, a SaaS from scratch, a builder from scratch. We used which, what was already there, which was WordPress. Um, and I, I think that's a huge opportunity for a lot of small business owners. The barriers to entry is, is so small compared to what it was before WordPress and before WordPress is what it is today. Um, cause you have all these tools in your back pocket. You have tools like mm. Divi and, uh, awesome plugins like gravity forms. And I mean, we, the list can go on and on. And so you don't have to create something from scratch. You don't have to outsource development and, and create something, um, completely prior. You can use existing tools and, and plugins and technology and use them in a new way, uh, in a way that's never been done before. And that's kind of what we do with premium website is we created a self-serve wedding website builder uh, using WordPress and plugins and, and so forth. Oh, fantastic. So it sounds like for you, the big solution was, you know, using WordPress and plugins to avoid building your own CMS or customized tools. Um, do you think there are common ways in which people already using WordPress still reinvent the wheel? Yeah. Probably, um, I think, especially for for newer people that aren't completely aware of all the solutions out there, all the the different plugins um, and so forth, they'll be trying to figure out a way to achieve a certain type of functionality or, or feature for a site for a client, um, and without realizing that there's a, a plugin that does exactly what they want and need. Mm. Um, so I, I think doing thorough research is important. Um, whenever you're, you're starting a new client site. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that's definitely something that, that people could struggle with without even realizing it. They're, they're trying to uh, invent something that already exists, mm. essentially. Gotcha. All right, let's jump to lesson number four. Keep WordPress as light as possible. So as I was reading this, I thought right away that I could see a potential problem or a conflict between this lesson and the previous lesson. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're not reinventing the wheel by using existing tools, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to acquire a decent amount of bloat, you know, over parts of plugins that you've patched together because you like certain features, but then there's all these other features that you're not really using, but they come with the different plugins that you've installed. So how do you keep WordPress light while also using a collection of plugins that are not probably created for your specific use case? Yeah, that's a great question. And and as I was uh, putting these lessons together, I realized that it, it, they could conflict and, mm -hmm. and contradict each other. Um, and, and I guess what I mean is um, use plugins that achieve what you want, but avoid unnecessary bloat. And so that, that kind of goes along with the, the first lesson of, of don't try to perfect the product and include mm -hmm. all the bells and whistles. Um, so maybe more, try plugins that do one thing instead of plugins that come with like 10 or 15 features that, you know, you're like, you want two of them, but it comes with like 10 more or something. Yeah, exactly. Um, so be more of a, a minimalist. Sure. Uh, you know, if there's a, a feature that's absolutely crucial, um, then then use a plugin. If it's something that like, oh, that'd be really sweet. We can get it to, to do that. Then maybe not, you know, mm -hmm. avoid the unnecessary bloat. Um, and so, uh, I'm trying to think of an example here. Uh, let's see, I wrote one of my notes. Um, oh, so we had a, a custom plugin that we used to integrate video tutorials throughout the, the whole backend. So for example, when there, we had a, uh, another custom plugin that added custom post types for, mm. for example, the wedding party. So when the, the bride or the groom is putting together the website, they could easily click add new bride and using custom post types in WordPress, it had it all easily um, and intuitively. Hopefully not add new bride, hopefully add new bridesmaid, right? Sorry, there we go. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me, add new bridesmaid. I got tired of the old one, but I still want to keep the website. I'm going to just add new so, bride. Yeah, swap it out. <laughs> Plan a new wedding date. Yeah. Um, so add new bridesmaid. And then uh, we had another plugin that added video tutorials. So on every page, you could just click a button and it would pop open uh, in a light box uh, a video tutorial on exactly mm -hmm. how to do that function um, on the page that you're on. And that plugin that we had that added that functionality... Mm -hmm. It worked great at first. There was no conflicts. Um, we outsourced it, and I, I had a, a guy that I hired 
um, through Upwork, uh, which is a, mm-hmm. a freelance platform. You can hire professionals from all over the world. And uh, so the plugin worked out great. And then a l- little bit later down the road, as we're adding in the, the final features before launching, I can't remember what it was, but it conflicted with that plugin. And so the video is no longer popped open in a ni- nice mm. light box. And so it broke that functionality. And so we had to uh, take some steps backwards and, and you know deactivate different plugins, reactivate them one at a time to figure out what the culprit was and, and yeah. figure out what was conflicting. And so um, essentially the, the whole point is try to keep it as light as possible. Only use plugins that you absolutely need. And uh, if it's not necessary, if it's an unnecessary uh, bell or whistle or feature that that doesn't um, isn't part of the the minimal viable product, then don't include it because it's just going to overbloat the system, overbloat mm-hmm. the database, and cause you all kinds of conflict problems in the future. And then when you do get maybe some more development money or resources, you can start having some custom work done for you. Exactly, and then that that takes a lot of the plugins out of the equation in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So lesson number five is the next one. Let's go to that one. So lesson number five, outsource services to diversify risk. Can you unpack that one for us? Yeah. And uh, that title might be a little confusing, but essentially the, the point I'm trying to make is um, use a combination of, of, of resources uh, so that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. So for example, we because this was a, a WordPress multi-site network, there was not just one site that we're managing. There was essentially um, what we we're hoping would be thousands and thousands of mm-hmm. custom websites that were all part of the the same database and, and server, which is the way multi-site works. And so we wanted to minimize the strain on the server as much as possible. And so we used sources like uh, Mac CDN and, and Cloudflare to take some of the strain off of the server so that the images were being loaded uh, from the CDN instead of on our main mm. server. Um, we didn't have any emails being sent through uh, PHP mail, which with WordPress, um, the, the default way is, is WordPress uh, sends any uh, password reset emails, any login emails right. with PHP mail, which is being sent through your server. And so with thousands of sites, that can be a lot of unnecessary strain on your server. Mm. And so we use Mandrill, which is a transactional email service. It's made by MailChimp, so it's very reputable. Uh, so we th- they have a, a plugin. So when, when you install the plugin and you put in your API code, any email that would normally be sent by WordPress and PHP mail is sent through their email servers instead. So it, th- that, again, took some of the, the unnecessary strain off of the servers. And then on top of that, we use Google Apps for business for our business email so that if there ever was a, plug, uh, a problem and the, the system went down, we would still have email intact. Mm. Um, and so just trying to, to f- use existing services out there, so I guess this kind of also goes along with don't reinvent the wheel, we were able to minimize risk and, and, and use a combination of, of uh, resources to uh, sure. make the system run as smoothly as possible. So, so basically uh, not running everything yourself through one central location that say some one thing would go wrong, everything would go down. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then also, I guess, working with other people who have better uh, expertise on very yep. specific tasks. Exactly. <laughs> and technology yeah. to back it up to. <laughs> yeah. And, and all of those companies I highly recommend. And yeah, they, they were a, a huge help in, in creating a system that ran smoothly. Fantastic. So number six, don't use a WordPress integrated support system. Okay, so this was interesting to me because it would seem like keeping a tightly integrated system, you know, WordPress and support w- would be a bonus. Um, but but obviously you had some issues. So can you tell us a bit about why WordPress support didn't work out for you guys or WordPress integrated support? Yeah, uh, so we initially thought that too. We thought in order to create the best customer experience, have everything in one place mm-hmm. right in the WordPress dashboard and using a, a WordPress support system. Uh, there's a couple of them out there and they're not necessarily bad plugins, but it created a, a couple of, of problems that ended up making the user experience even worse. Mm-hmm. Um, so what were so, those? So first of all, it it contributed to overbloating, uh, which goes back to one of the, the earlier lessons, um, trying to keep it simple uh, and not in as lightweight as possible. Um, because every time someone does a support request, that's a row 
in the database table. In the database, yeah. And um, so that was the, the first thing. Um, but then second, if someone ever got locked out of their site, how do they open up a support ticket? Because it's <laughs> supposed to be integrated in their, their website. Um, That's we a had, good point. <laughs> we, a, a lot of times we had customers use our, our sales support chat, which was supposed to be used for like pre-sales questions mm -hmm. because they had got locked out of their, their website. And so um, by using a, a third party system, whether that's um, Help Scout, I think is one of the big ones, Zoho, I, there's actually an article yeah, yeah. on Elegant Themes recently that went through a couple of, of the uh, popular support right, systems. Right, yeah, there was. Uh, using one of those services that specializes in a, a really great support system, keeping it off of your server. So again, um, not putting extra unnecessary strain on your server, not bloating the database. I, and it ends up being a much better user experience in the long run. And you could do some tricky things to, to make it seem like it's still integrated into your, your WordPress backend. Simple thing as having an iframe. So it's, mm -hmm. it's all in the, the WordPress admin as an, as an iframe. Um, so it looks like it's all part of the same system and it's all integrated, yeah. but it's actually not. And then having a, a link on your main website that um, they could also submit a support ticket. Right. And I've seen I've seen some large WordPress companies do that. I'm pretty sure WPMU Dev has the iframe support in the back end of WordPress. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you could access their forums through, like you said, the iframe in the back of your, your WordPress admin, or you can access the same forums on their website. On their website. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a much better approach. Cool. So lesson number seven, don't try to tackle support alone. Create a process and share the load. So what, what was your ex, your uh, support experience like or providing support like um, for web, uh, website? Yeah, so because I, I was the one that, that put together the system and I created the templates and I knew our multi-site network better than anybody, naturally I was the one that was responding to all the support tickets um, and I didn't seek help from my business partner or I didn't try to hire anybody to, to help out. And so it, <laughs> there was a lot of late nights trying to fix things um, or I'd get an email from a customer and I have to race home from having dinner with a friend or something mm. like that. And so um, this goes back to actually uh, a recent podcast episode, creating systems mm -hmm. um, and having systems in place um, so that you're not carrying that load on your own. So if I were to have someone um, that I hire to, to help with that and, and sharing the load using gravity forms to send it to two people at once or, or something like that and um, creating some sort of system to, to share the load rather than me trying to take it on all by myself, which became extremely stressful. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, that was my next question is what do you, what do you plan to do to, uh, to spread that out in the future to help improve your support process? Yeah, absolutely. So with um, the next project th that unfortunately I, I wish I could share more, um, but I can't, the, it's going to be a little bit different format because it's not going to be completely do it yourself. It's going to be more of a service that we're building it for them. So right off the bat, I'm going to need to hire some people. Uh, most likely I'll hire uh, WordPress people that, that have their own business. And so it would just be something that they could uh, earn a little bit of extra money with. Mm. And right off the bat, I'm going to need them to help build the site. So that'll kind of create built-in support as well. Um, so rather than waiting till we got super busy and then trying to hire people and trying to time it right, uh, right away, I'm going to need help. So that'll kind of help fix that issue right off mm. the bat. Cool. So uh, jump to number eight, lesson number eight. This is the final one. Create a sales and marketing plan and stick to it. So how, how did you guys handle this the first time around? So we, once we launched, we were kind of like, okay, well, what do we do now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you didn't have one. <laughs> ex yeah, essentially. <laughs> um, people always say with, with the internet, there's no such thing as if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. uh, there's too many websites out there. Search engines aren't going to index you right away. So everybody who starts a blog thinking they're going to be like instant Huffington post status figures yeah. that out really quick. <laughs> exactly. And so we had focused on building the product and, and perfecting the product, and we didn't really do too much planning on how we were going to market and sell the product. And it was kind of one of those things that we kept 
putting off. Oh, we'll, we'll get to it when, when it comes. We'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And so what ended up happening is we decided to, to spend some money on some sponsored posts on some of the mm-hmm. big wedding blogs and uh, doing some banner advertising. And so it was kind of like um, we would come across a, a, some, a way to market, a mm. way to advertise, and we would decide kind of on the fly whether or not we wanted to spend the money. Yeah. And so we didn't plan out ahead of time, okay, we want to dedicate you know, $5,000 to, to advertising. Let's find the best resources that will take that $5,000 and, and stretch it mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the farthest. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do the second time around is, is pl- have a detailed sales and marketing plan on how we're going to get from zero customers to a hundred customers to a thousand customers and so on. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, your, your background is, you know, you went to school for business and I guess I'm just wondering what are just as a, after hearing all these eight lessons, I mean, these are great lessons. So I'm wondering what, what for you coming out of school and having sort of like a formal education of business versus getting your hands dirty and trying to start a business, what was the big difference there for you What between reading it in a textbook or listening to it in lectures and actually doing it? Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of um, experience being the best education. Mm-hmm. I, I think having a business degree and, and learning in the classroom was a good foundation. Um, and I think it, it made some of these lessons easier to learn. I was able to learn them a little bit quicker maybe. Sure. But nothing can can take the place of getting your hands Just doing dirty. it. Yeah. And, and <laughs> diving in and, and getting experience. And I think especially for me, everyone has a little bit different learning style. But I learn from from doing um, sometimes I, I have to learn things that the hard way mm-hmm. and learn them for, for myself before I, I, I can really understand rather than looking at a textbook, which has a lot of um, hypothetical examples and, and yeah. so forth and kind of really learning it for myself. And, and, and I guess yeah. that's why I asked the question. Cause it's just, as you were saying, you know, you're talking about sales and marketing plan. And I was like, it struck me as like, Oh, you're a business major, like sales and marketing, you would have thought comes right away. But, but then you think about, Oh yeah, well, you know, you get so involved in building the product. You get so involved and invested in figuring out the little details and solving these problems that all of a sudden you're like, I finally did it. I finally solved all those problems. Like, let's get it out there. Let's do it. And then you're like, wait a second. There's a whole second stage to this process. And that's the selling and the marketing of it, not just the manufacturing or creating of it. Um, So it sounds like, I guess, the the takeaway of lesson number eight might be, you know, when you're thinking of developing a product, think of it in maybe two big stages with lots of small stages in between. (laughs) One would be, you know, getting the MVP, MVP ready. And the other would be preparing to launch a sustain, a sustainable, um, sales and marketing plan. Yeah. Is that, is that fair, fair enough to summarize it like oh, that? Absolutely. <laughs> no, you, you hit the nail on the head. And I actually had a class because I, my focus was on entrepreneurship. We had a class where the big project was creating a, a business plan. Mm-hmm. And so, um, it, I knew that, you know, I knew that yeah. I should have had that all planned out and, and so forth. But, um, sometimes you just have to learn the lessons the hard way. I don't know if it was just kind of denial where I was thinking, well, you know, this is a different type of business than we yeah. studied in, in business school. Um, you know, it doesn't really oh, apply here. And please, you know. I'm not trying to call you out on oh, anything. No, no, I, I just, I just meant like, cause well, cause it's funny. Cause you know, I've, I've tried to do a couple of different ventures of my own and you know, I, for a while, my job literally was writing business plans for people. I had a job at a startup where we specialized in different documents and social networking for um, entrepreneurs trying to get venture or angel funding. And part of what we did, one of our services was we wrote business plans. And that was specifically, that was my specific job was to write. So it's like, just like you said, it's like I had all the book knowledge I needed. I should have like, and even practical knowledge in that sense. But like when you're doing it yourself, sometimes you get so absorbed that almost before you even start the super absorbing process of creating your product, you need to have some semblance of an idea or at least know that there's going to be a stage before, um, you take that thing live, that it has to have that, you know, further development on the, on the sales marketing side. Yeah, exactly. Cause otherwise you end up wasting time and money, you know, mm-hmm. time by spinning your wheels, trying to figure out what's next and then money by spending money 
Little sort of a la carte whenever yeah. something comes up instead of, you know, here's, like you said, here's $5,000. Now, how do we get the most out of it? Instead of, hey, here's this cool thing. Oh, it costs 5000 Okay, yeah, we'll just throw all of our budget at that because that's what <laughs> we, that's the only idea we got right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So cool. learn that lesson the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So it uh, looks like we're getting to the end of our interview. And at the end of each interview, I like to take a moment and conclude things on a parting thought, usually prompted by a final question. So today we've been talking about building and launching productized services. We've covered a lot of ground, eight big lessons, plus a few in between. And I think for someone who's maybe new to the idea of a productized service um, and is interested in going down that road, that might be a lot to keep in their head all at once. So if there's one thing, and I know all eight are definitely important, um, but if there's like one thing that you'd want people to kind of keep at the forefront of their of their planning um, as they start and move into it, what would what would that thing be? I would say, and this is kind of combining two of the lessons, which I, sure. I'd say are probably the most important, but do the market research, learn your your target audience, learn what what they're actually looking for and and what would actually sell, mm-hmm. and then create an MVP and just get out there because, you're going to refine your your product um, by people using it and getting feedback. Um, you know whether you're a one man team or you have a couple different people that are all contributing. Um, those are only a couple of heads that are, are looking mm. at it, and um, sometimes you get a little bit too close to it, and you're you're not able to to look at it from an objective standpoint. And so sure. having other eyeballs, other people that are your potential customers using it and um, looking at it and giving you feedback is, is the, the best way to go. Very well said. Tim, thank you so much for coming on Divi Nation. I really appreciate it. You are welcome. Thank you very much, Nathan. Appreciate it. As always, I'd like to extend another big thank you to Tim for coming on the show and sharing a wealth of hard-earned wisdom with us. I feel like this was another great example of someone in the community stepping up and generously sharing what they've learned to benefit everyone. It's one of the reasons I think so many people have come to be really passionate about this group, the Divi Nation. And personally, I find it really inspiring and energizing, which is why I'm really looking forward to putting together something special for you guys in season two. But we're not done with season one just yet. We've got one more segment left in today's show. It's another edition of Divi Quick Tip. This time around, I'll be showing you how to style the navigation elements on Divi sliders. Check it out. In this Divi quick tip, I'm gonna show you how to style Divi's dot navigation elements, which appear at the right hand side of a page when dot navigation is enabled, as well as on Divi sliders. Uh, Here's an example of the side navigation version. And down here at the bottom of my page, I've got a little slider and you can see the dot navigation right here. So first things first, let's make sure that everybody knows how to make the dot navigation appear before we attempt to style it. Okay, so what we're gonna wanna do is go to the back end of any page that you would like to have a dot navigation on. And as long as you've used the Divi Builder, you're gonna see some Divi page settings in the top right hand corner. And you can easily see that dot navigation is the first one. You can turn it on or off very simply um, using these controls. So obviously you're gonna wanna have that turned on. And once you do, to style that, you're gonna need a bit of CSS, which we've provided. Uh, YouTube viewers, you can go to the video description for a link to the accompanying blog post and everyone else can simply navigate straight to our blog at elegantthemes.com. The post you're looking for is called Divi Nation episode 15 and you can find that in the community category. Okay, so once you've copied that CSS, uh, from there you can navigate on the back end of your own website to Divi theme options and in the general category or rather the general tab here just scroll all the way to the bottom uh, and you're going to see the custom css panel and you're going to want to paste that code here i'll go ahead and do the same okay so what we've done here is simply use the um, css selectors for both the uh, side dot navigation and the slider dot navigation and we've assigned them some colors uh, that are different than the ones that come by default so If you want to change the colors to match your own color palette on your own website, obviously all you got to do is change out the color code here. Um, You can just copy it straight from um, your customizer settings or your um, Divi page builder settings, depending on where you'd like to grab that color from. When you've done this, go ahead and click save. And you'll notice that if you go to the front end again and you refresh, 
your dot navigation will have a new color styling to it. Obviously ours here are just these sort of bright seasonal colors, but you can change yours to match the color palette of your website so that you'll have a nice customized integrated look um, for your dot navigation. Well, that's all for this Divi quick tip. If you have a quick tip request, you can leave it in the comments wherever you're watching or listening to this. You can also email them to me at podcast at elegantthemes.com with a subject line Divi quick tip request. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time. Well, that's all for this episode of Divi Nation, and with its end comes the end of season one. We're going to take a short break from putting out full-length episodes for the holidays. We're going to come back in the new year. My goal would be to come back early to mid-January, but it kind of depends on scheduling production uh, for season two interviews. I'll be sure to make plenty of announcements on our blog, on our social channels, and the Divi Nation shorts that I'll be producing in the meantime. So don't worry, you're not going to fall out of the loop. I'll make sure you guys stay up to date on everything podcast related. Now, before signing off for season one, I'd just like to say that it's been a fun ride. I feel extremely privileged to have been at the helm of this podcast. And of course, I love the production side of things, but I think my favorite part so far has been just getting to know the community on a deeper level and providing valuable content for everyone using WordPress and Divi. It feels like a lot to have produced 15 hours of content and uh, it is, but it's really only the beginning and I'm confident that next season and every season after it, we're gonna continue to get better and better and this show is gonna become more and more valuable to everyone who tunes in. So stick around and stay tuned via iTunes, YouTube, Facebook, our blog, our newsletter, however you want, just know that we're gonna be back very soon, before you know it, with more full episodes of Divi Nation. See you in 2016.